So you get me again for the uh, the 16S uh, market gene analysis part of the the lecture, and also we'll have a bit of hands-on tutorial um, after this, and the subsequent modules too. There will be a bit of a hands-on uh, tutorial, so you can actually try out some of the tools we covered in each of the modules. So uh, the learning objective for this module is to understand and perform marker gene-based uh, microbiome analysis. Specifically, we'll focus on 16S ribosomal RNA. Um, we'll use the marker gene to profile and compare the different uh, microbiomes or different uh, microbiome samples. And we'll look at some of the parameters that may affect your marker gene analysis and explain the advantage Oh, and this venture marker gene based microbiome analysis. But you actually get a lot of that also uh, in the subsequent uh, sessions comparing mar uh, marker gene based analysis to shotgun metagenomic analysis. So the general process is to extract the DNA from your samples to amplify with target, targeted primers and uh, once you get your sequences, filter the errors and build OTUs or uh, build uh, ASVs. And then you can carry out st some statistical analysis looking at the diver uh, diversity of your samples and across your samples, and also looking at uh, differential abundance of different features in your samples. And um, when I say features, roughly it correspond to uh, the subpopulations in your sample, so each OTU or each TEXA is considered a feature. Okay, so why, why, why do we use ribosomal RNAs? Um, there are several good reasons. One is that it's universally present in all living organisms, allowing you to compare the different communities using a single marker gene. Um, it also plays a critical role in protein translation, and because of this functional constraint, it's relatively conserved and rarely uh, acquired through horizontal gene transfer. So it, it carries with it uh, phylogenetic signals, uh, allow you to reliably relate organisms with each other. Uh, it also behaves uh, like a molecular clock in that it has uh, relatively a stable um, rate of, of uh, mutation. So again, useful for phylogenetic analysis and being used to build a tree of life relating all organisms to each other. And 16S, due to its size, uh, has been the most commonly used. Now, so uh, we use RNA as a proxy to understand the, the microbiome community. So at it's a tool that allows you to place my organisms on phylogenetic tree and to understand the compositions of the microbial community. Uh, so we'll look at how uh, to do that in uh, using Chine 2 uh, later today. Uh, it's also a tool that allows you to compare one community to another, uh, and this is referred to as the beta diversity. And uh, and in uh, Rob's lecture, you also see how to relate the different micro, uh, microbial features uh, to the different characteristics uh, that you're interested in, such as uh, obesity versus lean uh, populations, uh, certain disease states such as IBD versus no IBD, and find uh, uh, differentially abundant features um, that are or different differentially uh, proportion features are associated with your um, with the with the uh, the uh, uh, the pro uh, properties that you're interested in. Uh, Core sixteen is is not the only marker gene used, and depending on the organisms that you're interested in, there are. Uh, different marker genes available uh, for eukaryotes. The commonly used is actually ITS and, and 18S. Uh, reasons people using these different marker genes is that there have been uh, there have been databases established for these different marker genes, allowing you to compare your data to 
to uh, reference databases. Um, and for bacteria, uh, some of the other ones used are, include CPN60, which uh, evolves faster than 16S, so provides a, a, a better resolution than 16S for closely related uh, organisms. Um, and some of uh, other, um, what's my point? Some of the other genes proposed are Rec8, for example, that are uh, single copy genes that allow you to not have to deal with the, the copy number issues that are present with gene with markers such as uh, ribosomal RNAs that uh, there are multiple copies in the genome. And for viruses, there's no real universal uh, marker genes, but different sub uh, different types of viruses have different markers available to them as sort of communities establish a, a standard of a single conserved um, genes uh, for a given types of um, viruses. So for example, G23 has been used for bacteriophage uh, uh, comparison and um, RDRP, uh, uh, RNA-dependent um, polymerase has been uh, used for different RNA viruses. And th this publication here has a, a quite an extensive list of marker genes that have been, that, uh, have been used by, uh, by researchers for different uh, organism types. So a few considerations for selecting the appropriate marker genes. First is that they should have sufficient resolution to differentiate the different subpopulations of organisms that you're interested in. If you're studying, uh, say, different strains of uh, a given bacterium in a, in, a host pop, in, a, in a single host, for example, then choosing 16S will not give you the right resolution to be able to, to uh, come up with strain level um, differentiation, and you might need uh, much fast revolving marker, much fast evolving markers to, uh, to do so. Uh, also, in the case where you're interested in the taxonomic information of the organisms, then the reference database of known, organ known, known species or known organisms is needed for taxonomic assignment. Uh, so available of a good reference database uh, of, uh, for the samples that you're interested in uh, it would be necessary in that case. And um, single copy genes, as I mentioned, is preferred, but it's not always possible. And certainly for historic reasons, ribosomal RNAs, which is not single copy, have been used uh, as the most common uh, markers for microbiome studies. So when compared across studies, you'll need to use a standardized marker, such as uh, 16S. But more importantly, uh, if you're just sequencing a sub-region of uh, 16S using a short read uh, platform, such as MySeq, then the different variable regions can also give you different resolutions. So, um, so you need to use consistently the, the same region when you're comparing across data sets. Uh, sem uh, and as uh, Pauline has mentioned, experimental protocols and, bound and uh, could also affect your uh, results significantly. And we mentioned earlier that different biomimic pipelines can also affect the, your results and the importance of keeping track of what you did. OK, so uh, these couple of slides, uh, uh, we had it. I had a hint here sort of uh, for historic reasons as a reminder, but because a lot of people are asking these questions about DNA extractions and about contamination. So that's why we had a, a separate lecture uh, today to, to cover some of these topics in, in more depth. But here I just listed some of the uh, references um, for uh, on this specific, on, on, on DNA issues with DNA extraction. Uh, although one that hasn't been, have been pointed out is that it's possible to carry out some sort of fractionation to separate out a different organism based on cell size or other characteristics. And this, and um, it's also possible to select for uh, certain fragment sizes based on some automated uh, gel extraction process. So if you're interested in that, there's a, 
a video um, journal uh, about that topic. And just to reiterate that contamination, control for contamination is a major issue in microbiome studies where you don't really know the, the composition of, of the microbial community. Um, so as Paula mentioned that there are different controls that need to be used uh, for uh, throughout your experiments. Um, and also when it comes to empicon based studies, sometimes if your uh, target is really low, you can get mm -hmm. some non-specific implications. You can get primer dimers and so on. So the, uh, when you have low yield or low input uh, volume for your target uh, DNA, then you need to be especially careful regarding the control used to verify that your what your observation is is real. So this is a sort of typical anatomy of, of uh, anatomy of a, of a target amplification process. Essentially, let's say you're interested in the V4 region, uh, hypervariable region four of the of your 16S ribosome RNA. Um, the, typically, you would design a primer that course a Neo2, a PCR primer that annealed to the um, conserved regions flanking the region that you're interested in. Um, but a nifty way of doing a, a single step PCR instead of multiple step PCR is that you can actually attach the, um, the um, sequencing adapters, in this case the Illumina P5 and P7 sequencing adapters, to your PCR primer so you can amplify and sequence um, the, uh, the target without having to do a two-step PCR amplification. Um, and in addition to that, given the throughput of, of modern sequencers, we would typically multiplex multiple samples in one single run. So so there's a barcode index that uniquely identify each of the samples, and typically that's also incorporated as part of your primer design. And there are now that many. This is sort of the reference design that was published quite a few years ago by Rob Knight's group, and Illumina adopted it. Uh, but nowadays there are actually quite a few different um, amplification protocols available. Okay, so I think I mentioned most of these already, that um, in your PCR primer design uh, process, you need to be careful of, of um, inhibitors in your samples that may prohibit uh, the PCR process. So adding some uh, internal positive control to make sure the PCR process worked is important. And in some complex prime, uh, samples, you could <coughs> end up amplifying non-target uh, DNA. So downstream in your bioinformatic analysis, it will, it's useful to uh, to identify to to make sure that you're indeed amplify the right targets. And sometimes you might want to run your samples on a um, tape station or uh, or on a gel to verify what you have. Okay. Uh, so as I mentioned, that there are different variable regions in 16S ribosomal RNAs. Uh, for historically, V4 was chosen because it's the right size for Illumina uh, pair and sequencing. At that time, it was 150 base pair, but now it's uh, 250 base pair. So the the target has been extended to usually cover. Uh, V3 and V4 region, um, and again, stick with the same protocol that you're using for your entire study. It's important, and as you can see in this little graph here, the different variable regions ha have different uh, um, uh, sort of level of conservation. So uh, this y-axis shows the average. Um, uh, sorry, average proportion of the most dominant base. So the lower uh, the peak, the less conserved the particular um, 
the region is. And you can see V4 is actually not the most diverse region, uh, typically speaking. Um, so this paper, uh, this some study looking at the different variable regions and noted that the different variable regions actually selectively pull out, highlights different fractions of your microbial community, uh, different uh, sort of subpopulations of your microbial community. So for example, V1 and V3 uh, favors Pervitella and um, a list of organisms here that actually, um, uh, whereas v v4 and v6, for example, uh, would selectively pull out um, a slightly different set of organisms, such as Campylobacter and Enterococcus, which are more uh, gut-associated organisms, and so on. And also, maybe worth mentioning is that. Um, certain bacteria that are also uh, found in in the gut, for example, Fusobacterium, mm -hmm. um, can be missed if you uh, uh, if because the uh, some of the primers used for these regions, uh, even though they're supposed to be universal, still have biases, so they might uh, under amplify certain uh, populations of bacteria. Okay, so. Uh, a current MySeq run roughly gets you about 25 million uh, pair M reads, 25 to 30 uh, pair mil, uh, million pair M reads. And depending on your study design and the, the di diversity of your uh, microbial population that you're interested in and the, uh, the difference, uh, differences between the different sample types and essentially the effect size that you're interested in, uh, you would need to design your experiment to sample to different uh, depth and in and but in most cases if you're talking about very diverse communities a few hundred to a few thousand reads uh, is sufficient to differentiate a community but if you're looking for some rare uh, biomarkers or if you're looking for for uh, looking for differentials between very similar communities then you will need to sequence to much uh, deeper coverage. So, um, but in most cases, um, I think the recommendation right now is for marker gene analysis is still about 10,000 reads or so. Uh, should, um, well, 10 to 1,000 uh, to 100,000 reads or so should give you enough of a coverage to characterize your, popu uh, your microbial population. And if you're sequencing much deeper than that, uh, the, the, if the uh, return it, uh, diminishes uh, it sort of the, the cost effectiveness cost effectiveness cost effectiveness diminishes um, so as a result of that you can you can you, you we will use unique barcodes to, uh, to differentiate your samples and um, the uh, um, the other issue associated with uh, sample multiplexing or, or sequencing on um, MySeq in general is that um, because the way that the image or the signals is processed on MySeq, when you have very similar sequences, uh, it creates uh, difficulties for, for the machine to process the, the image. In other words, um, you can imagine that all the... Um, uh, if so. You can imagine that basically the, the image, uh, I either, if, uh, if, if, if um, a given base is all the same in your sample, what happens is that the image, uh, because it's, it's taking a, a shot of the, um, the different, uh, of a given base that lights up during a given cycle, so your image gets uh, either very bright or very dark depending on the cycle. In other words, it, uh, the reads are all synchronized. Then, uh, in that situation, what typically need to do is you need to do is introduce some diversity in your um, sequencing pool by adding either some 
reference sequences to such as phiX or con uh, in your in your sequence pool to diversify the sequences um, or alternatively you can sequence different marker genes in a single um, single sequencing run to diversify your your sequence pool and um, Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, the convenience of one-step amplification followed by sequencing um, sometimes a lot often because you're often processing large number of, of samples. You uh, as a, doing a survey using marker gene-based approach, uh, the, the convenience of one-step amplification is, is significant over the two-step approach. However, the, the two-step approaches allow you um, to to um, attach the same uh, uh, the same sequencing adapters to different populations of, of marker genes, so different types of marker genes. So um, the so using this protocol, for example, you can mix uh, 16s with 18s or with other types of marker genes, and 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 do a uh, and and look at the different. Uh, um, fractions of your, of your microbial population. So, for example, in when we're doing a study looking at uh, what kind of microorganisms, including uh, viruses uh, in uh, water samples, we typically uh, use a two-step amplification process to first use targeted primers to amplify the marker genes, and then anneal uh, the same uh, sequencing adapters to all the different markers and sequencing them all in one go. And this, is, this as I mentioned, has the added advantage of uh, diversifying your uh, sequencing population, uh, sequencing pool population, and, and therefore uh, improve the quality of the sequencing process. Okay, so now moving into the, uh, uh, the, the different sequencing uh, analysis platforms that uh, we can use for marker gene analysis. The uh, in this workshop we'll mainly be using Chime two, uh, which is um, uh, sort of a, a re re uh, development or refactoring of the a very popular software called Chime. Um, so, how many of you have used Chime one or two before? Okay, so about half. How many have used Chime two? Okay, okay. So, uh, so for, um, so for, um, I'll I'll get into that a bit later. Uh, and so, um, <coughs> so Chime two provides a, a nice sort of cohesive platform to to run your analysis in, and we'll show we'll, we'll see that. In the, the demo session, but there are also uh, uh, scripts that you can download and run. And one of the um, popular ones is uh, from Morgan's group called Microbiome Helper. And I guess Gavin, are you currently the uh, uh, maintainer for that? Or? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So so this is sort of a, a set of scripts that you can download and use to process your uh, marker genes, um, and there's a third one that was popular, uh, but I mean it's still being used, but it's less popular these days. Uh, it's called Mother. So how many of you have used Mother to analyze your? So okay, so same people. So I guess you guys try both Mother and and Shine. Which one do you prefer? Shine. Okay. Yeah, so mother was was um, was, was very popular with, um, before, but because it chime the first version of chime was really quite difficult to use, and it's uh, essentially a collection of scripts that you have to run, and some and sometimes they don't really um, have the the entire workflow uh, nicely uh, connected. Whereas mother provides a, a, a uniform uh, platform. Uh, and uniform ways of entering commands to and so it's much easier to learn and and much easier to use but um, it has fallen out of favor a little bit because um, oh actually the next slide we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that um, 
but also uh, you can build your own custom workflow by combining R scripts, command line scripts, and other tools by couple um, uh, by coupling together different pieces of uh, tools and, and build your own workflow. So, how many of you have done that? Uh, building your own workflow for market gene analysis. Just one or two. Okay. So, okay. So that's good to know that. Um, Hopefully the, the tutorial session will be will be useful to, to many of you. Um, all right, so I would want to do a bit of a comparison between Chime and Mother. Just uh, as I say, Mother it's uh, less used these days for uh, and for several reasons. One is that um, Chime two has vastly improved its user interface. It's still command line based, but the the um, commands are now standardized and um, it also as you'll see later that uh, it keep, help you keep track of the steps of, that you you do uh, in in, Ch in Chime 2. Uh, Mother has always done that for you uh, in a sort of a, a log file um, keep track of the steps for you so some people find that nice to be able to know you know each steps of your of your analysis. Um, the key difference between Chime approach and Mother approach is that Chime has always exists more as a wrapper to, to tools and so it takes existing tools and then design and, and sort of add it as a plugin to the Chime uh, environment. Whereas Mother typically re-implement uh, popular algorithms and, um, and uh, have and as a result of that, was able to provide a more sort of cohesive use, user experience. Um, and Chime, both Chime 2 and Mother now are very easy to install. Typically involves um, downloading uh, the files and and, um, and and run a single command to install it on your on your system. And in in the case of Chime 2. It can it will pull the, the necessary files and all the dependent programs for you automatically in its installation script. So um, vast improvement over the, the previous version of, of Chime. Um, uh, one downside of Chime too, however, is that it's a re-implementation, a rewrite of Chime of the original Chime, and therefore um, it has it still missed quite a few functions that are available in, in the original Chime, but but hasn't been ported over to Chime two. Some of those might be sort of historically uh, used, but not no longer relevant. But others, such as visualization of phylogenetic trees and so on, uh, would be nice to have it natively uh, incorporated in Chime two as well. But that's not the case at the moment. So you. You need external viewers to, to view some of your results. Um, and uh, the other uh, key difference is that for whatever reason, Mother hasn't implemented this ASV based approach. And I'll talk about the differences uh, between ASV and OTUs shortly. But, uh, and ASV has been um, proposed as, as a more accurate way of. Um, denoising your samples and identifying uh, subpopulations in your sample. Does anyone know why Mother didn't choose not to incorporate any ASV-based approach? I haven't been able to find reasons for that. It just seemed... <laughs> My understanding is that this hasn't implemented this. Okay. Just yeah, because I've, I've found a few sort of blog posts or, or uh, Rents in general by uh, 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 what's his name uh, Pat yeah that uh, sort of still defending OTU with, with that type of approach but for whatever reason it hasn't it hasn't implemented the ASV based approach yeah, it's been for Genovo, for G yeah. So it's a very right so. So, um, so I mean, uh, most of you heard of OTU before, and and for historical reasons, we'll still cover it in this workshop. Um, but also introducing a new concept called uh, 
Ampicon uh, sequence variant as a, a, a new approach to um, identifying features in your samples. Um, so this is the general bioinformatic workflow that we will go through uh, today in, in the workshop. So typically you start with um, one or more FASTQ files. Uh, in, the, in some cases they're uh, still multiplexed. In other cases they have been demultiplexed. Uh, so there are um, different uh, scripts or different processes that will allow you to, uh, to take either multiplex samples, demultiplex it first, and then, and then run it through the, uh, the workflow here. Or if your sample is already demultiplex, then um, it allow you to uh, associate the, the metadata to each of the demultiplex samples, and then again carry through through the workflow. Um, and as I mentioned, the metadata is, uh, need to be present in uh, as as part of your analysis. And there are tools that will help you manage your metadata in, and make sure that it's in a standardized format that's acceptable to, to Chime. Um, okay, so the first step is typically to remove the primers and, and of uh, adapters that are found in your sequences if that hasn't been done for you already. A lot of sequencing centers will give you the multiplex data back rather uh, than the, the raw data back and in that pro in that uh, in, in that case, often the, the adapter and primers are removed. So uh, when you get your data back uh, from a sequencing center, best to check with them what they've done with your sequences uh, before uh, before dis deciding what to do uh, for your, uh, by yourself. Okay, so uh, the preprocessing -proce pre removed the primers, the multiplex, and also uh, look at the sequence quality and remove any reads that are of low sequence quality. Um, and also, uh, it, as an option, you can uh, look for ways of, of checking to make sure that your samples uh, consist of only the targets and not uh, other um, non-specific amplifications. So, could be a decontamination step for your in the preprocessing, um, and once you're um, once you finish the preprocessing, uh, the next step is called fe uh, is feature identification. This is where you will either uh, combine all your uh, duplicated reads or combining uh, your reads into OTUs based on some predefined cutoff, such as ninety seven percent or use this uh, ASV approach. Um, essentially what you're trying to do is to uh, define the subpopulations in your microbial community and each, sub each subpopulation is called a feature in your um, analysis. Uh, and then f once you have the, the features, you can carry out taxonomic assignments to each of the features by comparing to um, a reference genomes based on sequence similarity, then uh, assign a taxonomic name to the, the sequence, to your sequences. Um, and uh, then you, <coughs> in the same step, you can build your feature table, which I'll explain what that looks like. Uh, and a feature table can contain both named and unnamed uh, features uh, that um, that you want to uh, care, uh, you want to uh, process uh, and look uh, for um, uh, differential uh, abundance and so on uh, downstream. Um, alternatively, you can take those sequences and you can. Uh, do phylogenetic analysis on the sequence and build phylogenetic tree. But in order to do that, first you need to align your sequences. Um, so the so the so you, so you can generate the, the distance matrix for building your phylogenetic tree. And both uh, feature tables and phylogenetic trees then can be used as as input for some downstream analysis. 
Okay, so we'll look at each of these steps a little bit more closely. Uh, so for the preprocessing, um, as mentioned already, the MySeq allow you to multiplex multiple samples in a single run. So the reads from each samples need to be linked back to its its uh, to the sample, and this is done using unique barcodes. Um, that the <coughs> sorry the, uh, the demultiplexing step often also remove the barcodes and, and the primer sequences. And, um, and Chime 2 has several different scripts to help you uh, do that. Uh, and this is uh, outlined in the, the importing um, tutorial. And I should also mention that Mother and other uh, tools will also have equivalent demultiplexing uh, algorithms that would that will work on your sample. Now about the quality filtering, so once you demultiplex your sample, some of the reads will be of lower quality. And Chime actually uh, filter um, the reads based on some quality parameters. And this is very similar. So Chime 2 and 1 have very similar uh, parameters, but uh, it took me a while actually to 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 identify how the the, the statement about how Chime 2 um, filters by default. So <coughs> essentially, uh, you look at the um, uh, from your from the three prime m for low quality a, and look at the number of consecutive low quality bases and. If it's greater than three, it would uh, start truncating your your reads from the three prime m based on the uh, the number of low quality bases, and um, the minimum um, fret quality score uh, required is, is four uh, to con uh, to be considered a sufficient quality, and also if the truncation goes too far into your read. Uh, in other words, more than seventy, more than twenty-five percent of your reads truncated, then it would drop that entire read. Uh, and um, because some of the downstream uh, denoising steps uh, does not tolerate uh, ambiguous bases, so by default, Charm Two would also filter out any reads that has any ambiguous bases. In other words, ends in in the sequences. Um, so this is sort of the default filtering parameter in, in Chime 2. But there are other quality filtering tools available. And, and often in the sequencing center, instead of running Chime 2, they will actually use some of these standalone uh, tools to identify. Oh, what's going on? Oh, just link to the tool. Um, to identify the. Um, uh, the adapters and the, and the primers and remove them and and also would trim this in some cases trim low quality read for you so again important to find out your from your sequencing provider what they did to the sequences if they did not give you the uh, the mo the original multiplex fast Q file back and you can uh, there's a tool called fast QC that's useful to s summarize your uh, sequence quality, and we'll see a representation of that uh, in the tutorial session. Okay, so um, so I mentioned some of the target uh, amplify might be non non some of the amplification might be non specific uh, off target. So um, you might want to take a subset of sequences and search against 16s or whatever reference databases you have. To make sure that it's it's on target, and also um, there are ways to um, look for uh, host specific contaminations. For example, by uh, searching against host uh, the human databases if you have a human sample, just to verify that your reads did not come from the host. Um, in some of the tools, uh, especially uh, uh, classifiers, uh, machine um, learning-based classifiers will happily take any random sequences and spit out some prediction for you. So 
if you give it a non-16s sequences, it, these uh, classifiers might not tell you that it's not 16s. So it will happily make a prediction for you. And so it's it's if you're not sure that you indeed have 16s, have all your sequences are on target, then it's best to to do some spot checking to make sure. Do you have an answer or? Yeah, well, what I use, I use Prince, so I can take a sign and approach. Like, you know, the Well, so uh, uh, maybe I'll jump to a, a, a pick the diagram. Uh, because you had trimomatic and you had gas. Oh, do I have a so heat? Oh, actually, it's in my other slide deck. Um, so in Chime, uh, what you can do is actually visualize the the average uh, quality per base position. So. Uh, it basically, vis visually, you can see where the, the quality drop-off is. And Chime will allow you to specify you want to cut off at that position. And you can do it for both 5' prime and, and 3'. Prime. Uh, so it's sort of visually uh, visual visualization of the quality and visually decide what to cut off. Um, and I don't know if it has implementation of, of other tools that would that would do the sliding window approach to cut it off. I didn't see it when, yeah. So the old version does, but then I don't think the new version, the, the Chime 2 hasn't had that implemented. I guess it's it just relying on the visual. So using PrintSeq or other uh, cut adapt or trimomatics all have similar functions to allow you to trim back the low quality ends. Uh, yeah, but they don't all have the sliding window from the window. That's right, yeah. So yeah. So some of them uh, would allow you to um, specify. I mean, all of them would train yeah. for you, but the sliding window calculation, mm -hmm. um, you say it's in the print seek, yeah. seek right? And, and the dust as well. Okay. Yes, yeah. So so you have ways of specifying which features or which read you want to remove from further analysis. Yeah. <coughs> All right. Okay. Um, so just to to reiterate the goal of marker gene analysis is that we're using these marker genes as proxies for the microbial community profiling. Uh, to understand who's there and understand to to know the relative abundance of these subpopulations, so we want to be able to divide or partition the community into subpopulations based on uh, their sequence variations. And as I mentioned, OTUs use a hard cutoff of a fixed percentage, typically ninety-seven percent identity. Um, but to do this well, the goal of bioinformatic analysis is to distinguish two variants from artificial variants that uh, that are due to PCR amplification or sequencing errors. In other words, um, try to reconstitute what's in your samples uh, re uh, regardless of the PCR and sequencing errors. And, and using a hard cutoff such as uh, uh, the OTU approach um, simply uh, it doesn't, it's not very accurate. So um, if we can reconstitute the, the subpopulations, then we can uh, under, we can have a 
better chance of understanding the subpopulation's biological roles and, and functional roles in the, in the community. And um, it's also maybe important to, to stress that the traditional OTU approach is assuming that every sequence is, or, or um, in that OTU uh, is treated the same. So it, just like we say, okay, a given species if, uh, or given strains of bacteria, you, it, you know that it's a population of bacteria, but you, when you give it a label, uh, you essentially treat that whole population the same. Right? So, um, so the assumption of OTUs is that all individuals in an OTU has the same role or function in the community. And certainly when you do any downstream statistical analysis, you're treating each OTU as the minimum unit of, uh, of analysis. Right, so, um, so the, as I mentioned already, the OTU picking uh, based on an arbitrary uh, sequence identity. And 97% has been shown to roughly correspond to the species level. But um, I think I have. But um, it's actually known that it, it, uh, people have done studies looking at reference genomes that the, the percent identity ranges somewhere between 1 to 5 or 6 percent uh, for a given named species. And also the different copies of um, RNAs in a given genome can have up to one to two percent of, of variation as well. So making this this approach not not very uh, not very accurate. Okay, so um, Chan supports three different uh, OTU picking algorithms. Uh, and this is the original, the original chime. The, the new chime does do that, but it's actually moved away from OTU picking and, and looking at the uh, ASV, which, I'll, which I will talk about next. Um, and the three different approaches are de novo clustering, uh, close reference, and open reference. So, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so the OTUs are clustered at 99% sequence identity. Yeah. Uh, so I think based on my experience so far, I actually think the, the OTU based approach uh, Really, you have to understand your your organ, your sort of microbial community, uh, to pick uh, uh, the right cutoff. So, um, the ASV based approach, which doesn't pre-specify a cutoff, uh, gives you a, I think, gives you a more accurate representation of of your um, microbial community. But yeah, but when you say ninety nine percent. So by the way, the slides I have here is slight update from what you might have. So I'll have to give you the, the new uh, slides. Uh, we'll, we'll upload it uh, later this afternoon. OK. Um, OK, so for de novo clustering, um, what you're doing essentially is taking all the reads and comparing all other reads and, and create a pairwise comparison table. Um, and based on the percent identity between the, the two reads, you start grouping them, uh, typically using a hierarchical approach. So what that means is that you take the first 99% identical um, set two sequences, group them together, and then find the, the next 99% identical sequences to, to this to the average of this group. And if uh, the next sequence falls outside of uh, the 99% cutoff or the 97% cutoff, then you create a new OTU, a new group, and then you find, again, sequences that are uh, within the cutoff uh, to, to that, what's called the seed sequence in that OTU. So this approach, um, because you're doing pairwise comparison to, to, to set up your, um, 
your um, analysis. It, it requires a lot of disk and memory space. Uh, people have come up with um, ways of subdividing your, your reads to smaller groups and then only do comparisons within that group. So one, one approach, for example, is that you can first do a, a um, taxonomic uh, analysis of your samples and then based on high-level taxo taxonomic information, such as at the family level or at the um, uh, uh, even genus, I think, is so. Say, so at the family or uh, level, you can s subgroup your your reads into different families, and then within that family, build your OT, uh, OTUs uh, within the families to reduce the number of uh, sequences you have to do pairwise comparison. And there are some studies done to figure out uh, what type of uh, distance measure. <laughs> within a cluster is the most robust and according to Pash Laws, who's the, the developer mother, um, he found that the average linkage cluster is most robust uh, uh, when you change the input data or the algorithms. But again, as I say, the OTU approach is ge uh, generally sort of falling out of uh, out of uh, favor now. Okay, so this is the clustering approach. Um, you do, so, as I described, the greedy algorithm uh, is used to achieve time and space saving. Um, so, this is achieved by clustering incrementally use. Uh, um, by clustering incrementally using a subset of sequences as centroids. So as I described, when you first encounter a sequence that's, uh, that fall outside of existing OTUs, you make that the new, new uh, centroid, and then you uh, identify other sequences that are similar to, to that first sequence that you encountered. Um, but because you're taking the first sequence you encounter as a centroid, uh, what effectively happens is that if you permutate or change the orders of your sequences, then a different centroid will be picked uh, the next time you do the analysis. So as a result of that, you can actually create unstable clusters uh, just by changing the, uh, the orders of your sequences. So that's one uh, key sort of disadvantage of, of this uh, greedy algorithm-based approach to, to clustering. And there are some uh, existing tools that try to get around this this issues um, by uh, first sort your um, for example first sort your sequences from the longest to the shortest so you favor the longest sequence as the centroid and and so on so um, different heuristics to improve the the stability of your clustering uh, the in contrast to de novo clustering uh, approach the close reference essentially is to match your sequence to an uh, existing database of reference sequences. So it's very much a way of assigning taxonomic information to your um, to your sequences. And the downside of this approach is that if this if your sequence is not found in the database, then it's discarded rather than uh, rather than uh, uh, Used for, for downstream analysis. Right, so <coughs> this is quite fast because you're just comparing your list of sequences to reference database, and also you could do this by subdividing your input uh, sequences and parallelize the process, run it on different computers. Each subset of your sequences can be run on a, a different node in you know, a cluster because the determination of uh, the mapping of, of your sequence to a reference um, read does not depend on other sequences in your data set, right? So each can be determined independently. Uh, so this is suitable if, if the samples that you're studying has a really good reference database. In other words, it's a well-studied uh, um, sam uh, sample type. So for example, the, uh, the human microbiome has 
uh, done a lot of reference genome sequencing, so it has a pretty good set of, of reference sequences available for comparison. Uh, contrasting that to any of the environmental or animal studies, much, you have much uh, less information available about the, rep, uh, about the genomes that are uh, found in your samples, and, and certainly much less reference genome sequences available. So, um, so close reference is generally good for uh, well-studied uh, sample types, but not, not very good for novel sample types. So this approach called open reference combines essentially the, um, uh, the de novo OTU calling and with the, the taxonomic mapping approach and give you an OTU table that consists of both the uh, unnamed and the named uh, taxa in, uh, in the analysis. So uh, because your OTUs actually represent a collection of sequences, and when you're doing analysis, you cannot take a collection of sequences um, and, 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 and analyze it individually. So uh, the next step is that you need to choose one sequence in each of the cluster, each of the OTUs, as the representative sequence. So you can use that sequence to generate a, a phylogenetic tree, for example, uh, or you can use that sequence to calculate the distance matrix. Um, and because, because you're picking a single representative sequence for a, a collection of sequences or collection of organisms, uh, essentially it's the downstream analysis is treating all organisms in one OTU the same. And so you reduce the, a group of organisms down to a single representative sequence and the number of um, equivalent uh, sequences in that OTU. Right. So, and the representative sequences can be picked based on some predefined criteria. Uh, often it's the most um, abundant sequences that are found in a single OTU or the longest sequences that are found in, a, in an OTU. And sometimes people use the, the sequence that's uh, sort of uh, the, uh, that's at the center of, of the OTU as, as the representative sequence. But again, like how you pick representative sequence can affect your downstream analysis. And because of this problem, uh, a couple years ago, um, new types of uh, denoising or new types of identifying features have been um, introduced and this is called the amplicon sequence variant uh, and this is a uh, attempt to avoid uh, an arbitrary dissimilarity threshold and uh, the goal here is to be able to distinguish sequence variants that are um, uh, to distinguish sequence variants from um, artifacts that are introduced during PC, uh, during uh, sequencing and in in much more limited extent during the PCR process, um, but I'll, but um, the biggest uh, disadvantage of, of this approach is that it's not very it's not sensitive to early round PCR artifacts. So imagine if you have a PCR if you if you have an early early round PCR error that's propagated in your PCR uh, process and it generates multiple copies of itself, then uh, this particular process uh, particular algorithm is not able to differentiate that from a, tr a true um, true variant uh, that are in your sample. Okay, so. So data two is one of the uh, the approach. Uh, it stands for division amplicon denoising algorithm. And uh, so conceptually, how it works is that um, imagine this is your starting ma uh, material <coughs> has these four different species. The um, or let's call it four different uh, taxa. Um, 
and the size represent the, the abundance of each text, uh, each taxon. And in the amplification process, you might introduce some minor variations due to sequencing errors. So for example, these rare ones um, are derivative of this original um, population. And as a result of that, you get these red small dots around it. Same thing for the green, same thing for the, the blue, and so on. Um, the OTU approach, essentially, you are drawing fixed radius circles around these in an attempt to essentially hide the the, the artifacts that are derived from, from sequencing errors and, and or PCR errors. Um, what Data2 attempts to do is to statistically, statistically um, and, and using uh, customized error profiles, essentially recombine these errors, uh, these minor populations due to error, due to sequencing errors, back to its original population. So re-establish um, the pop, the uh, re-establish the original uh, population structure. Okay. So this is a, a one of the supplemental uh, figures from from the paper, and essentially it's a little bit harder to to see here, but. Um, Essentially, it's comparing uh, the ASB approach to the OTU approach. And uh, on the y-axis, it shows the frequency of uh, basically the relative abundance of, of, a, of, a, um, of, of a feature. And um, the y-axis shows the, the, um, the distance or the... the um, um, the um, the variations or the, the diversity uh, across these uh, these features, and the important um, and this is a, a mock community, so the original uh, population structure is, is known. And um, what you're seeing here for the um, for the uh, uh, the blue uh, symbols are features that are um, uh, uh, generated by data to compare to to the OTU approach. Um, so the, what you see here is that for uh, features that are both abundant and less abundant, uh, but are uh, more that have um, uh, how do I say this, that are more uh, similar to each other or more, in other words, more closely related uh, taxa, um, data too is able to differentiate them better than the OTU-based approach. In uh, uh, in terms of accuracy, because the the target population is known, uh, you can also see that uh, the uh, uh, the square ones are the uh, what's in the in the mock community. You can see that the data to approach uh, reconstitute what's in the mock community better than um, than the OTU based approach. So these square boxes on this side. Um, and, and also the triangles are um, considered the, uh, the correct ones, basically. Whereas the, the cross and the, the stars are considered incorrect. And you can see that it does have some, uh, some errors in reconstitution that, reconstituting the population, but generally um, performs better than the OTU-based approach. Now, so um, the f even though ASV has been, and there are pu um, publications recommending the use of ASVs over OTU, um, this block note from um, uh, 
here. I'll call it up actually. This plot node actually discuss what are the the uh, some of the advantages and disadvantages of ASV versus. Uh, okay, I'm not sure why it's not. So it actually has a nice description on why uh, the oh sorry there you go has a nice description on why the uh, um, the ASV uh, the sort of pro and cons of the ASV approach. But to summarize it, um, as I show you that it um, the the main improvement is that. Uh, for um, organisms that are closely related to each other in your community, the ASV approach has better taxonomic resolution in, in separating them out uh, into subpopulations in your in your sample rather than lumping them together into a, a single OTU. Um, the other key advantage is that unlike OTUs where you have one representative sequence, uh, representing a, a collection of, of slightly variable sequences, right, up to 3% different or up to 1%, depending on your cutoff. Uh, the ASV approach uh, provides a consistent label because the um, algorithm essentially regenerates the, the original population structure. So each ASV is supposed to represent a cluster of identical sequences. So essentially, uh, you will get one sequence um, rather than multiple sequence in each of the cluster. And as I mentioned, sometimes if you're, you have PC, early round PCR errors, then the ASV could actually um, represent an artifact in your, um, in your uh, experiment. But generally speaking, it, it does pretty good. In, uh, pretty uh, does a pretty good job in uh, in reconstitution reconstituting the the populations. Now the disadvantage is that because it doesn't have that clustering uh, step, if your samples are highly diverse, if your sample population is highly diverse, then or uh, complex, then you can have um, a lot of ASVs, and that make the downstream analysis uh, more, uh, maybe not more difficult, but certainly more more time consuming, and, and may require more computational resources to do. Um, and it's also sensitive to data quality, as I mentioned. Lastly, um, for um, 16S and other multi-copy genes, because each ASV is supposed to represent a cluster of identical sequence. So if you have a genome with multiple 16S that are slightly different from each other, each of those would become an ASV rather than uh, in the OTU-based approach, they would be uh, grouped into a single OTU uh, if you use a low enough threshold where the, the intra-chromosome uh, variations uh, 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 it does not is not an issue. Okay, so uh, the other feature identification uh, post processing is, is the removal of chimera sequences, and I won't get into too much detail here. But the general principle is you want to look at your reads and identify sequences where the reads map to two different. Uh, targets in the database, two different reference sequences in the database. And then uh, that typically uh, signals that you have a, a chimeric reads. Um, so as you can see here, the one part of the, um, uh, one part of your query sequence matched the A sequence very well, and the second half of your query sequence, the one in the middle, matched B very well. And you know, there are tools that help you pull out those cases as potential chimeric sequences. 
and study have shown that approximately one percent of the reads uh, in uh, in a uh, marker gene study uh, can be due to chimeric. Okay, so um, so taxonomic assignment, as I mentioned, is analogous to close reference genome and um, uh, close OTU calling, I mean. So, oops, I'm not sure why it's keep jumping. Um, so, uh, the, uh, um, the process of, of, OT, of uh, taxonomic assignment is simply to give uh, OTUs a name that you can refer to. And the um, process typically is take the OTUs and the representative sequence from the OTU, do some similarity sequence search against a reference database, and then take the, the top hit or the top several hit uh, as potential candidates for your taxonomic assignment. Uh, but what's important is to specify the matching algorithms that you use and the taxonomic database that you use, as this could also affect your uh, taxonomic assignment. So here's just a list of uh, common databases that's been used for uh, tax taxonomic assignment. And here I mentioned that um, the reason that people use 97% is based on the observation um, that the generic, uh, that the assumption that the bacterial genera um, have uh, the species level uh, variation is somewhere between 95 to 99 percent but what's been sh shown is that uh, actually there are a lot of exceptions uh, to to the rule yeah So it's, I've seen it, been, I think Chime 2 still uses a version of, of that, but maybe just for archiving purpose and it's not been updated. Yeah, but not, okay, so, but yeah, but it's good to know that it's not been updated, I guess, and um, yeah, so Selva, I think, is still the one that's been maintained as far as I know, but. Uh, RDP, I also don't think it's been actively maintained. I don't know. Do you guys have any information on that? <coughs> okay. Should be okay. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, as I said, green, uh, green jeans. For historic reasons, still had as a, a archival copy in Chime, and uh, but um, but yeah, but it's not been uh, been actively maintained. For RDP, yeah, because I last looked at it, it also hasn't had a lot of action, so. Yeah. So, so I should also mention that NCBI has has taken over the some role of, of curating 16s sequence. So NCBI actually does have a 16s uh, database that it maintains as well. Uh, all right. So, so this is just to show that um, once you have the taxonomic information, you can a, a common display is to show it in a a stack. Um, bar chart to show the relative proportions of the different taxon within uh, uh, across different samples or across different um, sample types. Okay, um, and I just want to quickly mention uh, the structure of a feature table. Uh, typically, a feature table consists of um, a, sort of the number of uh, the recount of each feature in um, 
in a given sample. So it's a two by it's it's a a two dimensional table, a, a matrix of uh, features in one direction and and samples in in another direction. So each feature could be a an OTU so uh, or an uh, an ASV, and this represents the number of reads that uh, uh, within that feature from sample one and sample two, for example, same feature has uh, half the number. Uh, and as, as Rob will talk about later, that uh, typically you need to transform the recount to proportions or to other uh, or normalize some other ways uh, before you do analysis because um, you sequence, first of all, you sequence the different samples to different depth, of, uh, so you have different reads per sample. And um, also, uh, the read depth is not, uh, it, um, the, um, there's correlations of features uh, with each other, and that uh, count-based uh, uh, approach to, uh, to analyze the, the sample would, would, would have unacceptable uh, false discovery rates and, and biases. Um, and the, the read table usually is kept in this biome format, which um, I won't. We don't need to to get into. But it's just to say that there are standardized formats for for different um, uh, for different for for the microbiome data. Okay. Um, so also for uh, historic context, uh, because the, we have a uh, traditional multiple alignment approach to generate alignment is too slow when you're dealing with tens of thousands, sometimes millions of sequences. Uh, there have been temp uh, development of template-based aligners. One of them is called PyNAS, and another called Inferno, based on uh, actually RNA secondary structure for aligning um, your sequences. And these template-based aligners essentially only require your query sequence to align to, to the template rather than a pairwise alignment that need to be done in multiple alignments. So they're much faster than multiple alignment, but they're also less accurate and, and generate distance uh, less representative of the true phylogenetic distance. So the uh, Multiple alignment algorithms have been improved to allow t at least tens of thousands of reads to be aligned, and this is currently sort of the preferred approach to when you want to generate sequence alignments. Uh, and then the next step is to generate phylogenetic trees uh, from your sequence alignments. Again, different tree re reconstruction tools are available. The most popular one is probably the fast tree algorithm that's implemented in Chime 2 and in Mother and many other tools because they allow large number of sequences to be constructed, large number of alignments to be constructed into a phylogenetic tree relatively quickly um, and, and relatively accurately. Uh, Rob, are you covering rare fraction? Uh, Okay. Well, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't think I'll. You are right. so so. Um, as I mentioned, because your each of your samples could have different number of reads, um, and the number of reads can affect the your downstream analysis when you're trying to determine the diversity of your samples and so on. So typically, if you sequence more, uh, you get uh, a higher diversity. You get higher. Uh, Diversity read out. So the rare fraction, rare fraction process, essentially take the same number of reads from each of your samples, and um, and uh, the sam and and normalize your samples to the same number, same number of reads. Um, and this approach has been discussed uh, extensively in the community, both the pro and cons. And some people say it has minor effect on your on your results, some people think it it, it actually makes it, it reduce the sensitivity of your analysis significantly, and so on. So, I highlighted some alternative approaches and and why the field has moved to more compositional based approach rather than 
count-based uh, approach that uh, uh, Rob will mention, uh, some of the compositional-based approach in his uh, lecture. All right, so um, I'll take a few minutes just to finish the last few slides, um, introducing a few more concepts, and then we'll jump into the uh, hands-on portion of the, the marker gene analysis. Okay, so, so we talked about generating a feature table. Um, and using the feature table, you can characterize your samples or you can compare your samples to, to each other. Um, so I want to introduce a couple concepts. One is called the alpha diversity analysis. And this is the diversity of organisms in a single sample or in a single environment in sort of the more traditional ecological uh, study. And it's typically a combination of two different measures uh, in different ways. One is the richness or the number of species or taxa observed or estimated. And the second is evenness, in other words, the relative abundance of each taxa. And you can imagine that um, for the same richness, say you have 10 species in the two environments. If in one um, environment, the evenness is, is um, different such that there's one uh, organism that's highly abundant and the rest are low abundance versus um, the second population where it's a uh, second environment where the, the subpopulations are quite even. In other words, you have 10, um, 10 species that are all roughly the, the same number. If you go into that community that's by, sam by sampling it or by sequencing it, the results that you get can be quite different. In the first one, where you have a highly abundant organism followed by low abundant uh, organisms, highly uneven environment, you'll have to sequence a lot deeper in order to see the rare um, organisms. Um, whereas in this, the second one, because they're all relatively the uh, same um, evenness, you'll be able to detect them with much shallower sampling. So the alpha diversity can, can affect uh, the level of sampling depth you require to, to see, to, to characterize your, um, uh, your uh, population. So alpha diversity take both evenness and richness into account. And there are many, many different measures of alpha diversity. Uh, some common ones, such as Shannon entropy, uh, phylogenetic distance, um, have been um, incorporated into uh, CHIME and into MOTHER. And often they do give you um, similar um, uh, characterization of your community. Now, so um, this is just a graph showing if you, know, if you plot each of your samples, in this case two, uh, samples uh, plot their um, um, alpha diversity, in this case the phylogenetic distance, uh, in a close reference. Uh, so the, the, the y-axis is slightly different. You can see that in uh, for the same set of samples, um, sequencing to roughly the same depth of coverage, when you have close ref using close reference OTU picking, <coughs> give you a, a lower um, diversity, in this case 20, compared to both open reference and de novo, which roughly the same, about 30 um, uh, in the in the um, the PD measure. So um, uh, just to show that the again the OTU picking process could affect your diversity measure as well. Beta diversity, on the other hand. Uh, is the, the differences in diversity across samples, or how different your samples are from, um, sample types are from each other, or different samples are from each other. And again, there are uh, several um, <coughs> measures of beta diversity. One of the popular one is called Unifract. Um, and another one uh, implemented, and in uh, CHIME is, is breaker, this dissimilarity measure, uh, looking at 
uh, OT abundance across different samples as a measurement of uh, of the differences between these samples and contrasting that with the Jakar measure um, um, the Jakar measure only look at OTU presence or absence so it does not take abundance into account um, and so when you are trying to characterize your samples it's also useful to know whether your similarity measures or dissimilarity measures look uh, takes into the relative abundance into account or just measuring the presence or absence of, of OTUs uh, or um, in uh, the <coughs> the different measures uh, as I mentioned often if your signal is strong enough it give you comparable results but but do have their own caveats that uh, worth that's worth looking into when you're uh, doing comparison, when, when you're picking which ones to use, and often by searching for um, different discussion forums, uh, people will comment on the, on the application of a given diversity to their samples and what they uh, see as the, the issues associated with the, the, the measurements. Now, so, so how is beta diversity um, Calculate it. So when you so instead of the the feature table where you have OTU by sample, this is actually a table of uh, sample by sample um, distance measure. So so you have the um, <coughs> you have the sample one compared to itself um, is um, I. You know, it's 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 uh, obviously identical. So you get an assignment of one, and um, sample one compared to sample two, for example, less similar. So you get a, a 0.4 in the in the uh, score, and the lower the, the similarity, or the, the more the dissimilarity, the 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 lower the, the score, and then the, but this information does not. Um, you can you can use this to to um, observe the pairwise distance, but um, the print uh, component uh, the um, dimension reduction uh, algorithms such as principal components or principal coordinate measures allow you to take this and reduce into a two or three dimensional <coughs> graph, so you can uh, more in, in a way intuitively see how the the different samples are uh, grouping with each other and uh, and see their similarity and dissimilarity. Um, let me see if I can get to. So this is an example of the the uh, principal coordinates graph um, taking the distance measure and projecting it onto, in this case, a two dimensional graph. And intuitively, you can see this population here. Uh, it's much more different from this population, <coughs> from these two populations. And the, the, um, these uh, dimensional reduction algorithm works by essentially taking a high dimensional, so I have a, a, a graphic, <laughs> a picture representation here, right? So it takes a, a two dimension, a, a multi-dimensional graph, in this case three dimension, and reduce it to two dimension. But intuitively, you can see that th these two representations of, of these two different projections, one gives you much more information, and you can tell that this is a chair. Whereas this one, the way it's projected, it gives you a shape that, that it's harder to interpret whether it's a chair or, or if it's something else. So the way the, um, these dimensional reduction program works is try to preserve as much information as possible in the high dimension while projecting it in the, in the lower dimension so you can visualize it and um, commonly <coughs> it do so by maximizing the variations uh, uh, um, uh, in your in your variables okay so um, you can also um, take all your samples and um, 
use the distance measure to build a hierarchical tree, and then the, uh, in 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 a way view the clustering as a as a sample tree and uh, samples that are shared um, that are more similar to each other would be would be would show up uh, show up as clusters in in the tree. But this is force you to show the samples in bifurcation tree, so sometimes it could be misleading uh, to uh, to force your samples into bifurcation trees. <coughs> I think I can skip this because I'm pretty sure I saw some slides talking about the uh, the marker gene versus shotgun comparison. Um, so I want to end with um, two re two fairly new references, both published this year, um, just on gen general um, best practice for for um, 16s microbiome studies, and and one for this first one actually pretty much covers all the topics we're covering in in this workshop. But um, hopefully the workshop provides you with with a, sort of a opportunity to to ask some questions related to, to these best practices. So if you have a chance, take a look at these, and we can certainly make them available to you if you couldn't download it uh, yourself. Uh, if, I mean, if it's not, you don't have access to your institutions and whatnot. OK. So um, <coughs> typically, for these labs, and, and certainly in the subsequent sessions, we will give you a, a web link to a version of the um, to, to the lab to the to the lab with instructions and so on, but when I was preparing this marker gene lab, I was looking at the different um, tutorials available online and realized that you know there are some great tutorials out there, and it, it's not really useful for me to reproduce what they do. So instead. Of, what I want to do is sort of offer you um, three different options. Um, one is to, uh, but, but all three options uh, give you an opportunity to use Chime 2 to, to process some data sets. So the first option is just to follow the default, the, the first Chime 2 uh, tutorial. And this is for beginners who have never used Chime 2 before and just want to do the step-by-step -step tutorial. Um, and you can also try the second tutorial, the, the fecal transplant tutorial, uh, which gives you a different starting point uh, where the samples have been demultiplexed already, and you take the, the demultiplex samples and put and try to and try to import it into Chime two for analysis. Uh, whereas the first one, uh, you take a single FASTQ uh, file. <coughs> that have not been demultiplexed and then uh, have Chime to uh, demultiplex and do all the processing for you. Um, the second option is uh, to use a, a book chapter that Rob and uh, his student Michael wrote uh, on 16S analysis. It by and large follows the same uh, tutorial as the, the Chime tutorial but use a different data set and uh, highlights. Do you have the printout? Yes. Yeah, the okay, great. So uh, we'll give you the book chapter that you can can take a look, um, and I'll show you um, how to start with the analysis shortly. The third option is for for experts. Basically, if you have run. Chime 2 before, where if you have done other analysis before, and you have your own data set that you want to just put it through uh, these work uh, these uh, workflows, you're welcome to try that, and then we can try to help you as much as we can in terms of if you have issues or if it gives you an error that you don't know how to fix. So um, the third option is only for people who have have already used Chime 2 uh, in the past. Um, I should also mention that um, the second option we will use the same data set for, for module seven. So, in a way, you with module seven will give you the results, but you this gives you an opportunity to play around with the data set and generate the 
the results that will be used for statistical analysis in module seven. Uh.